Uh, but the important thing from the perspective of this talk is that I use test-driven development since 2005, and I've made all the possible mistakes, I think. At, at least I haven't found anybody else who had more problems than I did, uh, because, well, maybe I'm not that smart. But because of that, I have, uh, I have some experience that I would like to share with you to actually help you out. Now, I'm not, I may not be that interesting, but whenever somebody gives you uh, good advice, you have to understand what context they have. Because if you, if you take a good advice and apply it in, in the wrong context, it will hurt you a lot, right? So to give you a little bit of information about my context, I work for a company which has got about 700 microservices, uh, more than 600 engineers and 10,000 servers. And I work as a team leader and uh, as a developer as well. And most of this is on the Spring and, and uh, Java and JVM stack, basically. So this will be the samples that I have. And I see the problems that I've, I've I kind of met and I've solved uh, uh, throughout the, all, all the different teams inside the company. And I also work in Bottega as uh, uh, giving, basically giving workshops and teaching people how to solve their problems. And I travel from a company to another company and see that the same uh, patterns repeat and, uh, again and again. So this talk uh, uh, it will try to actually summarize and solve this for you. Now I have to, first of all, to actually show to you that uh, there, is a, the, the, there is a very good talk about the um, different uh, philosophical aspects of different approaches to test-driven development. And this is the talk by Sandro Mancuso. And if you want to, the philosophical approach and to understand deeply about the different ways you can actually approach the problem, you, you should watch that talk. My talk is going to be a little bit different because my assumption here is that you have tried or you used this driven development but, and you were promised like this beautiful landscape and this beautiful joy right and, and journey throughout the uh, test driven uh, uh, experience right but you kind of feel like there is some shit thrown into your face and you're not really sure what are all those people so 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 happy about because yeah you know it's painful so what's going on? So what I will try to do is actually I will try to uh, show you the most basic, uh, the most pop, uh, popular problems and actually solutions for them to get you up to the speed with only 45 minutes. So that's my limit, right? The typical problems that people have when using test-driven developments. First of all, some people try to test classes and methods, basically you, you, uh, using unit testing for testing every single class and every single method. And this, this is quite popular, and a lot of people who are starting with test-driven development think that this is the test-driven development, in fact. And what, what they do is they find out that there is a problem with it. And the problem is this. This is a class diagram, beautiful class diagram of my production system, actually. Uh, so if you try to test every single class, you will have to mock all the collaborators of that class, right? And you will have to record the behavior of all the different collaborators uh, inside your test. And you will have to do that for every single test and every single class, which means you will write a shitload of code and it will take time. And also what it means is that whenever you are going to try to actually add a new feature or change the behavior of an existing feature, there's a large chance that you will break the compatibility of your APIs of the class because, hey, this is just a method, right? I'm adding another parameter, I'm changing something there. And when you do that, a lot of unrelated tests will break because they had your behavior recorded inside the mocks. So this kind of a situation, I actually, of course, I made that, uh, uh, that mistake uh, in my life. And this, what happens is that you're changing a, a, a few classes and then 500 tests completely out of the blue, not connected with what you do, break, right? And you fix those 500 tests, you introduce some other refactoring out there, and then another 2,000 tests break. So if you try to test classes and, and uh, methods, this is way too low to, to, to be able to actually um, refactor anything or do any changes. And another problem with that approach is that even though you have 100% of the test coverage, you, your code will not work in production. Well, why? Well, because you have just unit tested every single class, not all of them together, not how they work and how they interact, right? So that makes it, uh, uh, a lot of people actually go into the opposite direction. They say, all right, so if all those unit testing for classes and methods is bullshit, basically, right? Should we rather just trust the integration tests? Because, well, if this works in an integration test, there is a high probability that it will work in production. 
And they do this, and they go into only testing with the integration test, and they start, and it's way too slow to, to do test-driven development. Now, uh, for an empty Spring uh, uh, context, actually, an empty Spring application, right out from the start Spring I.O., it takes 3.5 seconds on my machine to actually boot up and, and fire the test, right? Now, uh, for a microservice with a lot of dependencies, with embedded Mongo and so on, it takes 22 seconds to start. And I, could, I would not be able to do test driven development if I had to wait more than a second, okay? If I had to wait more than a second, it's not possible for me. Why? Because it breaks my flow. Basically, if something is longer than a second, it breaks your flow of thought. Now, uh, and pe pe people who do this actually end up in this area where you have the whole application suit tested within 45 minutes. And it's such a horrible experience that people do not fire those tests anymore and actually wait for the Jenkins or whatever continuous integration server they have to do it. So is there any kind of a solution to that? Because too low is too bad, too high is too, 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 too slow. Of course there is. There is actually this whole thing called modules. And you can test, you can like find a middle ground there where you can test every single module of your, uh, of your system using all the unit tests that you, you can have, and then test the integration, on the integration path, just do just enough testing, right? So why modules make sense, and testing modules make sense? Because the architecture of your system does not change so often. If you add a new feature, there's not a large chance it will actually change the architecture. If you are lucky, your architect, the APIs of your modules will change once a month, probably. And if you are very lucky, then maybe once in a half a year, you will be able to change the whole architecture. And it's OK if in, once in half a year, my tests break, and I have to uh, change the um, mocks and, uh, and refactor them, basically, right? So what's a module? A module encapsulates its data and uh, does not allow to access its data outside from the public API. A module has clearly defined uh, collaborators and APIs, which makes it very simple to actually test. A module has got all the layers, so this is a vertical slicing, and it's very much like a microservice. In fact, when I work with my team, we, t we tend to actually sometimes start with another module inside the microservice, and then when it, the module grows, we take it out and actually put it into a new microservice of its own. It's much faster this way. And not all modules grow that big, right? And modules are usually uh, connected with the bounded context, which means that they have definitions of, the, of, of terms on their own. So what I will show you today is how to test, how to do it, test your modules as black boxes using only unit testing there, as many as you want, because these things go uh, run in milliseconds. And then, if you want to have the, and you need to have the integration test, then you, will, you should test only the crucial parts, the parts that bring the money. Why? Well, because if something breaks on production, but it doesn't influence any money of your company, and, and your client basically, well, let's say that we broke a thank you message, thank you uh, message on Allegro, for example, after you bought something. People don't care about that message. People do not care about that screen at all, right? If it breaks, what, so what? I don't want to be wake, uh, woken up in the middle of the night just to fix it, right? I can c come back later during the day and just, just work on it. So instead of that, I would rather use monitoring, right? But the crucial parts where you have the money, you cannot break that because otherwise you will be out of the business. So this is also very natural, and I will show you how it works, and a very important one trick with, uh, with actually modules, based on a very simple example of actually an application when you're just browsing movies and, and renting movies uh, like in the 90s, right? So let's take the first module, and when you start actually implementing something, after you have, of course, the architecture diagram, and because you have to think about architecture anyway, uh, you, you start to do it, right? So you have to talk with something, with some class. Basically, you have to talk with a module. So I will call this entrance point as a, uh, as a facade. So for a film module, for example, I will have a film facade. And I cannot create the film facade by just calling new, by just calling a constructor. Why? Because a module is a bunch of classes. It's, it may actually be quite big. It could be 50 classes altogether. So if the, something is big and it's not that easy to configure, then you shouldn't put it into the constructor, right? So if there is a lot of logic on this, I will create another class, which is here, a film configuration, that will give me a fully configured module for my tests, right? And I'm doing a unit testing here. So I'm, I'm writing some DTOs, for example, 
and then I write the tests themselves. And, and during the testing, of course, I discover a lot of things because that's how test-driven development works. You discover that, for example, to be able to show something in, the, in this module, you have to be able to add a movie to the, to the catalog. Otherwise, you cannot take it out, right? So I write that. I discover more. I write more tests. Now I want to, uh, for example, uh, list all the uh, movies. So I, I see that actually taking out the whole database is a stupid idea. So maybe I'll need paging and so on and so on. And I add all the corner cases for, the, for everything else. And I end up with a lot of classes, actually not so many, but a, a bunch of classes to, to, to perform that for me. And uh, in those classes, I have a film, which is a domain object, uh, some kind of a creator, film type, film configuration, film facade, which you have already uh, seen. This is the point, entry point I'm talking with. And to be able to actually uh, put a movie inside the, uh, my module and then take it out later on, I need some kind of a database, right? But I cannot go into the I.O. I cannot touch the I.O. The reason why I cannot touch the I.O. because it's uh, several times slower than working in memory. And if you touch the I.O., basically you have the integration test out there because you're integrating with the I.O. and it's slow. So what I can do is I can implement the whole I.O. part in memory. Like, for example, writing an in-memory film repository, right? But how hard is it actually to implement a database in memory? Well, it turns out that all you need is a hash map. That's pretty much it. And OK, this is a full imp implementation of a, of a database. It may not be the best database out there. It will definitely break if you put more data than the, you have memory, for example. And, and it's got all kinds of issues. But for testing purposes, it's perfect. It's even perfect if I want to run it on my machine and just show it during the demo or just play with the application on my laptop, right? So I do that. And then the most important part, I have the film configuration with the, with the method film facade that will give me the whole module configured. And I have all the code, the, the domain code, the logic out there to actually test my idea whether this whole module makes sense. I'm working really, really fast because so far I had no Spring, no frameworks, no nothing, right? Basically just plain Java. And anybody can work with plain Java and, and have a very fast experience or Kotlin or, so, or whatever, right? I have verified everything I, I wanted, and I have all the corner cases covered, all right? And this is really fast. Now, let's add the I.O. So I want to add another test. And this time, I'm adding an integration test there. And for the integration test, and this is an ugly one, I'll show you how to write it better in a moment, what I do is I actually do not test every single feature of the application. I will actually go into the finding two, film, two movies, and I need to enter two movies into the module, for example, and then finding one of them inside the same test. Now, this is usually thought as an anti-pattern because you have several things tested in a single test. But I do this here because I have already every single method, every single interaction point with the module tested in the unit tests. And here, I can focus on the flow. This will verify the, uh, the integration part of the application, the, the, the part that brings the money. But what I do here is I set, by having just one test, for example, here, I'm saving the time I would otherwise have to put in, make an insert into the database, for example, right? I need the data only once, and then I can t verify different steps on it. So I'm cheating a little bit just to gain speed. And after the integration space, of course, I add the I.O., which in Spring is very, very simple. I add the controller, I add uh, the interface for a repository, which will be implemented by the Spring data, for example. And that's pretty much it. But now my configuration looks a little bit different. And here is the trick. Now I have a configuration. I've added the configuration annotation from Spring, and I have the film facade here. And this is the method that is going to be called in the integration test, right? And also during the production. And this, this part is building the whole module. However, it needs the I.O. It needs the implementation of the classes that actually talk with the I.O. And I have another, another method which creates the whole module again. However, this time I have no parameters whatsoever. And this al allows me to create the module with the in-memory uh, um, version of the I.O. classes. And the important thing is this method should always call the other one, right? Why? Because if you're building the same module in unit tests and integration tests in different ways, then you will actually have two different modules. There is no, uh, uh, you, you, you may not be sure that it will actually work in production. Now here, the only thing I need to replace is the I.O. because, well, it's too slow for me to, to use, right? So that's what I do here. 
And the clue here is not to let the I.O. out during the unit testing part. Why, why is it important? Well, let's say that we were, we were to use this method, actually, in the, in the uh, unit testing, giving the film repository. We could write it by just giving it a mock, for example, from Spock, or we could uh, even create the in-memory film repository and just pass it through to the test and pass it to the film facade, right, here. But the problem is, and I found it in, in the, uh, how it works in practice with people, if the developer has access to the internal state of the module by just having the reference to the object that, that keeps the uh, state, right? What the developer would do is actually verify, is verify the state in state of the behavior of the module. So actually, we will not see tests that uh, uh, in, uh, talks with the module to put a film in and then see if the, we can f find those films. But instead, we will see that the developer tries to insert this in directly into the, the repository and uh, ver or verify after inserting whether this thing is directly in the repository. And this breaks the encapsulation. If you do this, then you no longer have uh, uh, modules as black boxes, but you're looking into the, uh, 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 the implementation part. And if you do this, then whenever implementation changes, your test will break. So don't do that. Put the I.O. out, uh, and don't let the developer actually use it. So if, if, if we are doing this, and I'm replacing every single I.O. part as my, more, as my more, uh, own in-memory implementation, because it's so easy, right? So are mocks good for anything or stops? And actually, they are. They are good when my module needs to talk with another module, for example, because then I can uh, test my, my, uh, every single module uh, independently using mocks, and this will me, allow me to actually take them out into different microservices, shuffle them around, or replace them with some of the shelf product, for example. So if I have an article, uh, and if I have an article module that talks with two other modules, then I can give it mocks. And this will allow me to have the behavioral verification, which is I'm just testing the, the behavior of the module, but each module alone, right? And this is basically behavior-driven development. It's not going through the UI. It's actually testing the behavior of your systems. And in this uh, case, um, the modules are the systems. And if you want to go even further with events, and you had plenty of uh, talks uh, uh, yesterday and today, actually, on, on events, you should do that. Because then the only, the, the, the only thing that will pass to the module will be some kind of an event publisher or event bus, and that's pretty much it. So that's the first trick, to have all the tests on the unit testing level for module. Now, the second trick I want to talk about is the, it is the problem of too much information. Whether you have too much information, it doesn't help, actually, and it's, it's the same situation as if you have not enough information. Let's have a look at a test that creates a problem. This is a real test from a real production system, okay? And it's a good test in the terms that actually it works, it verifies the correct thing, but it's not very easy to look at, OK? Now, what happens here? If you look at the labels, this is Spock framework, by, uh, by the way, then uh, the test says, should find images by category. And the first it's given, image in category X, OK? That's wonderful, easy. We have an image in category X. But then you look at the code, and you see Rambo X. Oh, that's interesting. Why is it Rambo? Does it break if you put commando there? Will they fight with each other? What happens with that? And then you see some other code, and then there is an image in category Y, and then there's a block of code. And there is the third one, which is image in category X and Y. OK, so I have actually three images. But there is a block of code that actually stops me from seeing that, and I need to filter, filter it out. And then when we fetch by category X, then only the image from the category X and X and Y will be visible, right? So can we actually do something with this? This is too much information. We, without losing any important information for the test, we can actually work it. And we have refactored this to that. You have, there are three images in category X, Y, and one in X and Y. And you see that in the code. And then when you fetch by category X, then you will have the one from the X and X and Y. And this is the same information without any clutter, without anything else that is not important for the test. And this is much easier on the eyes, much easier to understand and reason about. So the important distinction here is about the implicit and explicit information. What should be explicit, what should be put inside your test is basically the important information to understand the context and requirements of the feature or the test, right? 
and implicit information is hide everything else. If it's not important, whether it's Rambo or Commando, hide it out, right? And for every single line of your test, you should ask yourself whether this is crucial for, the, for understanding the requirement or not. And to give you a few examples, if I need a film from a catalog, I can say persisted films first, because I do not care which one it is, okay? I just need one of them, that's it. If I need a new release from a catalog, I can say persisted films, find, uh, film type, new release. And that's, pretty, that's all the information that I need to show instead of like create, uh, using a constructor and so on. And if I need to have something more, more uh, complex than that, and I know, need, for example, an unpublished article which is hard to get, then I will move that out into another method which will explain what it does without showing all the gory details which are unimportant from the perspective of this test. Okay? Now, to be able to do this, for every single module, we found out that we need to prepare testing data, or uh, basically the inputs and sometimes even the outputs, because the outputs quite often are inputs for another module, right? So for every single, single module, we create classes which we usually call sample something, right? To be able to do very fast testing. How does it look like? Uh, and, and to be able to modify them as we need. So for example, if I need a new article in my system, I will call a, a static method sample new article. This, this, will, me pro pro this will provide me a, a, an article with all the uh, good information out there. But if I need an article which has got an illegal, illegal title, basically an empty title, what I would do is I would call the method sample new article given in the title of null so that I have, an, uh, without g g uh, giving any other information because every, everything else is correct there. And if I need the, the same thing with all the other properties of this object or other objects underneath. The, the, I give it and I create an API and, uh, with sample data that I can reuse to just point out in the test what is the important part. So how does it work underneath? Where underneath I have an ugly method that takes the uh, map of string of object, then it overrides, actually it adds this to the, to the map, which means overriding everything I have defined here. Uh, with the map of all the good data. And then I use the builder to basically do it in, in a type safe way uh, and create it, uh, uh, and it, the object itself, right? So I use a map out there because it, uh, it's a very good thing, especially if you're using Groovy, because it allows me to test both my objects. And I can also serialize this into JSON, for example, and use it to verify, to, to use the same data in unit tests, in integration tests, and also for verification of the outcome uh, if I want to. So after creating all the sample data, it's very easy now to cr uh, create new test cases for the unit tests. However, there is one more thing. If you're writing integ uh, integration tests, like talking with the HTTP and so on, you have another problem, which is every time you want to test something, you want to write another, uh, another interaction with the system, you have to think about which protocol it was, what's the URL, basically, what are the parameters. I want to call something to do, to, 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 for uh, the system to do something for me, but I don't really remember what, uh, what should I call. And what happens is usually people go into the uh, controller, for example, or search through the classes and see what are the strings out there. So instead of that, I have another proposal for you, and it works great for us, which is en uh, encapsulate every single common interaction in the integration tests, inside, a, for example, a trait. It could be a static method as well, but I'm using trait, traits which in Groovy are just like interfaces with the state. And I'm actually grouping those traits by the uh, name of the endpoint. So I have operating on article endpoint, operating on article actions endpoint, and so on. So that when I open a test, integration test, I know exactly what it talks with, okay? Makes it very simple to reason about. Now, then, when I want to post a new article, I don't have to think about what URL I'm posting to. I just call a method which has a domain a meaningful uh, name, like post new article, to actually create the article, giving the minimum information that I need. If I want to update the existing article, I do this. If I want to preview an article, I do exactly the same thing. So I'm hiding all the gory details. Now, underneath that, I have the, uh, my trait, which will have all the methods, which will actually hide underneath whether I have, what, the, what is the URL, what are the uh, protocols, what is the content type, and so on, so on. 
Underneath, I will have another trait which will even uh, allow me to actually hide whether this is an async or, uh, or not, or synchronous call, uh, and uh, allow me to actually uh, get the information out, and so on and so on. And the important thing is this. When you're writing a system, and you're writing some a API for the system, like external API, like HTTP, for example, you need to make important decisions about what is the protocol, what is the URL, what is the schema, and so on, what is the payload, everything, right? But you need to make it only once. And you should make it only once, and not make the developer, which is yourself, next day, think about it again, because you don't remember it anymore. And if you, if you hide it underneath integration, uh, uh, those traits and in, in, in methods, what will happen is that it will allow you to easily write uh, more tests or explore the situation. And here is, an, for example, an exploring test, which will call the post, which goes through the whole life cycle of an article in an integration test, just to see what happens if the user clicks so and so. And you will see here that there is a post new bio, par, uh, here we will have post new article, update existing article. And if you see how easy it is to actually do after you have those hidden away, then you will be able to write as many, as, as many different scenarios to see what happens on production when you have a back report, for example, as many as you want. And this will be very, very simple, okay? Okay, so now we have the testing data. We are testing only modules. We have the gory details of the integration part hidden away, so we don't have to think about it again. Once is enough. But there is actually one more technique that I would like to show you, which is very powerful. And this technique comes from the realization that how, what is the best way to actually explain to somebody a new requirement? And if you think about it, most of the developers would, would, would say that it's okay, if I need to explain to you how the system should work, the best way I can do it is give me a whiteboard. I will draw it, right? I will talk with you and I will draw some pictures. And can we do the same thing in, in our tests? Well, it turns out we can. So for example, this is another example from the production. We, we were writing a test for what happens when you add a new category to a tree of categories there. And the, the first test that we wrote looked like this, okay? And again, this is a correct test. It tests what it needs to test, right? But it's like an ugly block of code. And the question is, could we make it easier on the eyes? Maybe add uh, empty spaces out of somewhere, right? But if you were trying to explain to me what happens when you add a new category to, uh, to a tree of categories, what would you do? You most likely would uh, draw a picture of the, of the tree, right? And then you would write, uh, show me where the category comes in, or you draw another picture of the tree with the category in. That's pretty much it. Can we do it in tests? Of course we can. We have to start, for example, with actually uh, creating the tree of categories, right? So here you have a tree from, of categories when you see that the root is A, right? And everything is underneath. And then when we want to add a new category under, let's say that we want to add a category C under G at position one, then what I do here is C plus G at one, which is the minimum uh, possible information actually to, under, to explain what the test does, right? And then when I modify, because this creates only the DTO for modification, and then when I actually interact with my module to, to make it happen, then the outcome can also be represented this way, and it's quite obvious what's going on. You, we have added the G at, um, under C at uh, position one, right? So that's very, very simple on the eyes, very, very easy to understand, okay? Now, what on earth is this, right? If you're using Groovy, then it's just a simple thing because you have to create, we, we have to create some kind of a class which will represent a node of our tree. And as you can see, I'm, I'm also de declaring all those things, A, B, C, D, A, uh, E, F, and so on, because it's not important inside the test. And uh, this is a very simple thing. It's got an ID and a list of children, which is also the, the category nodes, right? So it's a very, very simple construct. And then we have this part, which is calling a method without a name. And in Groovy, that's, called, that's a method called, named call. That's pretty much it. And we have a nice representation of, a, uh, of our tree, right? So what's with this part when we add something? Well, this is also very simple because this is just overriding a plus operator. And I use a plus operator because it's very natural here, but you could, you could use a method as well. 
And once again, I create a static internal class category node at position, which is just a category node in, uh, in, in position, and I override the operator there and add an at method, and that's pretty much it. So as you can see, this is a very, very simple DSL, very, very simple uh, classes to actually allow you to express your requirements and the whole feature much better. So what happens when we move a category? Because this mechanism pays best if you reuse it, right? So if I want to move a category, then I, uh, again, draw a, a, a tree of those categories. Then I want to say, OK, I need to modify the tree, moving category best B under F, right? And of course, I get the category B under F after, uh, after a while, right? So this, this works better and better the more tests you have. And because all, uh, all the tests that I have are for the module, and there are plenty of them, then uh, it pays off very well. And this is just a right shift operator in Groovy, which is just a method called right shift. That's pretty much it, right? OK, so what's another uh, example of that? Because you can see, OK, that's, pretty, that's, that's great. You got categories, but uh, can I do it without a Groovy, for example, without uh, operator overriding? Sure. Let's say that we want to move articles. When, when categories move in, uh, in Allegro, for example, articles need to follow those categories. Because otherwise, uh, with eventual consistency, you would not be able to find articles anymore. So I'm declaring here six categories, which actually are not categories. These are paths to categories. And you can see the tree kind of here, like the, the root level will be C1, and then you have different categories underneath. And I declare also all the uh, articles in, in those uh, categories, so I have six, uh, six articles underneath as well. And then when I want to say, OK, what happens when a category moves with an article? Well, uh, I need to say that I want to move a uh, uh, category. So what I do is I reuse the path to C. So I will reuse this one, OK? And I will say this is my source. That my destination is the path which comes with C, then B2, then C2. So I'm moving the C2 under B2. And then when I call it, I can verify this again without drawing a tree this time, but I can verify that the current path for my article AC3, which is in category 3, is actually right now C1, B2, C2, 3, 2, right? So again, by creating a very simple classes and very simple DSL, I'm simplifying uh, expressing the behavior uh, out there and the requirement for the test. And you may say, OK, uh, Jakub, this is wonderful. We are not working with trees, OK? So go away. This doesn't work for us. But you can think about uh, how, in how many places you can actually apply uh, this pattern of using, reusing the whiteboard. And for, for another example, if you were actually to create a system for car sharing and you needed to find a closest car to your, uh, your position, what would you do? On the whiteboard, I would draw a map, right? Do you want me to draw a map in the ASCII art in the inside the desk? That might be a little bit of an overkill. So what, can we, what else can we do? Well, actually, we can do this. Let's say that our position is 0, 0 for simplification. And let's declare four cars, and one with position 2 and 2, the second B one, uh, uh, with 1 and 1, and so on and so on. And you can clearly see which one is the closest, actually, to the position 0, 0. And then let's, say, let's talk with the system and tell them that, OK, these, these cars were detected. They are registered, but only two of them are available. And it's obvious right away that what you want to have if you, if you want to search for the cars from the position 0, 0 will be the B and A in this uh, order because of how, how close they are. And this, this is all, right? So you don't have to draw a map, but you create kind of a DSL just to rep a representation of the logic inside your module, right? And this whiteboard approach is very, very simple. Just think about whether when you are writing a new module, think about whether you can represent the same thing inside a uh, uh, with something different by creating a small DSL. And you, you can think about it, OK, if I needed to explain that to you using a whiteboard, what would I draw? Okay, And it simplifies the requirements a lot. It's really worth it. And the clue here is very, very simple. You have to remove every single object that uh, clutters the image so that the image is crystal clear and you send the message throughout without any other clutters, right? right in, like in this picture, when you see a man attacking a river with an axe, which is obvious because you have no other object that will uh, take away from your view, right? So this is, this is really an essence of, the, of working with good unit testing and good tests, right? And if you, if you follow that, then you may think, OK, so now we are writing domain-specific languages for each module, because each module can have a different spe domain-specific language, right? 
Uh, what if we don't need to actually do it? Maybe we should just go as high as just writing all the tests in, uh, in, uh, in plain English, for example, right? And there are actually two different uh, types of uh, testing frameworks. One of them is like Cucumber and JBehave, which is writing tests in plain English and then writing some glue code underneath, right? And the others are like J Spock and JUnit when you both mix the, uh, the, the explanation for the test, which is the comments uh, out there, and also together with the code, right? And the first one is the very high abstraction level, which is, okay, this is my perfect DSL, only English. Whatever I talk with the client, I will use it there. So there are some benefits of using the frameworks for uh, as plain text, but the main benefits are that the business is supposed to actually work with those tests. So business, because this is plain English, business should be able to actually write them, to modify them, and to ex do exploratory testing, which is verifying themselves without asking ask for anything. Now, from my experience, this never happens, okay? Uh, this never happens, why? Business does not actually want to write anything. They, want, they, they would rather prefer to call us and explain to us what needs to be done. Why is it so? Well, the reason is business uh, people are not trained in logical thinking, okay? You do not, thank you. You do not need proper logical thinking and logic, okay, to do business. The real world is messy. It's not binary. So basically, you can scream a lot, and somehow things will get faster. Try screaming at a computer. Nothing gets faster. If you break the logic in a real world, things will still happen. If you break the logic, the compiler will never forgive you. That's simple. So we are trained in, in logical thinking and in strict logic, right? Business people are not. They would get very, very. Uh, they would very get confused and angry very, very fast if they had to work with those files. Even this is, even though it looks like plain English, just because there is a compiler underneath. So they prefer us as an interface to actually explain to us what they want, and then we can actually implement that in the code. And this works best. So the, all the advantages of using the plain, uh, uh, the tests in plain English, for, I have never seen them in, in real life. Never seen them used this way in real life because business doesn't want to use them. And there is also the disadvantage of actually writing all the glue code. It's a little bit harder. So with specs together with the code, it's much faster from my perspective to write and maintain them because you can see all those things together. And the outcomes of those tests are just as readable as the, uh, the, fi the files in plain English, if you use labels. So if you're using Spock, I recommend the uh, plugin which is called Spock Reports, which creates beautiful reports of the test that you can send to the client and say, hey, is this the test how the system should work, for example? Why not? Business cannot modify them, but that's okay. We don't want the business to mess with the code at all, right? Business doesn't want to do that as well. So if you think about it, uh, which one is better? The question here is actually about the level of abstraction. You, you want to have, by writing a DSL for a module, you want to have a, mo a level of abstraction that will uh, be high enough to hide, uh, to show the, uh, to focus and help you focus on the important information so that you will see everything that is important and nothing beneath because if it's uh, 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 low enough at the same time actually to help you work with it because you have to write the code, right? So if it was plain English and you have some other interpreter underneath, then you, there, will, there will be a um, compiler uh, underneath that, then you have two levels of abstraction before you actually touch the code. And with those frameworks, it's much easier to actually do this, right? So now we know uh, that we can actually write all the unit testing and uh, have the modules, have the sample data, uh, have the interactions, and uh, how to write proper tests that look very, very nice. But still, sometimes, your modules and your systems will get slow because of how many interactions with the I.O. you have. So, for example, I have a module that needs to talk with Mongo, Elastic, S3, AdWords, and Kafka. That's a lot of I.O., right? So I can test all of that, but even my integration test, even if I do the happy paths only, right, and the, the paths that only bring you money, I will not test all the corner cases in the integration tests because I have them covered in the unit testing then I still have a problem of this running way too slow, okay? And the question is, what can we do about it? Well, there is actually a very simple trick that I can show you. You can, th first of all, you have to think about which of those uh, IOs change together with your domain code the most, right? 
And for example, do my AdWords client change a lot when I, uh, change the, uh, when I do refactoring in my code? Not really. This is pretty much set, right? Does Kafka events, the, does the events that I sent to Kafka change when I, when I uh, work with my uh, domain code? Not so much, because actually these are the events that are consumed from all the different parts of my company, which means any system can touch them. And actually, I use Avro as well, so I will need to publish a new version of the schema. So I try not to change that too, too often, because other systems would have to actually implement something to, ver to, to be able to consume the new version, or just ignore the new version anyway. Right? So, these two do not change so much. Same with S3, and even Elastic as it actually does not care that much uh, uh, about my objects. It, it will, it, you can throw everything at it, and it will just index it. And the only problem uh, with it is whether you want to search uh, with the same uh, weights as uh, you got on the very beginning. The thing that changes a lot when I change the code in my module is actually MongoDB, right? Because I need to migrate the data I need to think about what happens underneath for, with the I.O. So what means then is that I can have all the integration tests with the MongoDB, because this changes a lot and I need to fire it often, but I can then do something else. I can treat all the other, uh, um, all the other actually endpoints and all the other mechanisms as libraries. So I have an API for AdWords, or I have an API for Elasticsearch, I can move my, my whole API, the whole code that actually uh, talks with this and does the integration, into another jar. And if I have in another jar, and I have it completely tested out there with only integration tests, because why would you need any unit test for integration with Elasticsearch? Does it even make sense to have unit tests for testing Elasticsearch? You want to test this, whether these things are, works or not. So I move all the integration tests out there and do only integration testing inside the jar, and then I can use this jar in my project as a library. Whenever you take a library from the internet, you're not testing the library, or maybe you are testing the library just to find out how it works, or if it works at all, especially it's a Node.js library. But then, after that, you don't have to think about it because you assume that there are tests and all the corner cases are covered, right? So you can do the same with your own code, removing everything into different jars, and then what you do is I have, an, uh, of course, I have an in-memory version of my Elastic, right? Because it's very simple to, basically Elastic does the same job as any database. So again, you need a hash map and you're pretty much set and so on for every single library. And the clue, clue here is to remove it and move it outside of your everyday build, because, everyday, because you don't want to pay the price for every single time you build or test the application for having an elastic somewhere on the class path. That's pretty much it. So that's a very, very, very simple thing that you can use to uh, help you uh, remove those slow tests. And then uh, uh, one person in Wroclaw actually asked me about, you know, that's all great and cool, but our tests still run very slow. And I will show you how slow tests run, actually, for me. So here you have uh, our production microservice, one of the microservices. Here you can see I have my, two, there are about two modules uh, in this microservice. I have my microservice tested. I have 478 tests running in four, under five seconds, right? which is about the average I usually get, okay? But if I want to have integration tests, even without the elastic search and everything else, for example, I will have a situation like this. These are my 133 tests running in 50 seconds, okay? So now you see that I, I'm, I may, I, I, I'm okay with waiting one second for a single test when I work with it, and I'm okay for waiting about up to 10 seconds for all the suit of all the tests, okay? But if I have to wait 50 seconds every time I fire those tests, that's not good enough for me. So what I do is I will use the integration test, testing only the crucial parts that bring me money after, after I have all the unit tests done, so I fire this guy only once in a, once in a while, right? And this allows me to actually go fast with uh, test-driven development. Okay, so the guy in, in Wroclaw actually asked me, okay, so that's all beautiful, but you know what? We are using test-driven development, writing a lot of unit tests, and even those unit tests are slow, even though we do not touch the I.O. And I said, wow, how is it possible? How many tests do you have? And he said, well, 10,000. And I was like, you have built a system that has got 10,000 tests? You shouldn't have done that. 
You should have done several systems that have much less tests than that, because what is the chance that you actually have to work with all the code base at once? Zero, okay? You cannot put it into your head. This is why microservices were invented or re rediscovered, to be, to be honest, right? Because we don't have, we, you cannot use all that code at once anyway, so why put it all together? That's pretty much it. And your goal is to keep it under 30 seconds. Actually, the unit testing, I would say, under 10 seconds, because it turns out, uh, and there is the research from 1993 from Jakob, Jakob Nielsen about uh, the importance of time. And after one second, everything that takes longer than a second breaks your thought of flot, uh, uh, flow of thought, right? So if you are a programmer and you have flow, waiting more than one second breaks your flow. If you wait more than 10 seconds, it loses your interest. So what it means is that you're on the Facebook now, or you're on a Twitter, or maybe you went for a coffee or something else, right? So if you have to wait more than 10 seconds for the whole suit, that's a problem. And if you have to wait more than 30 seconds for the whole suit of unit tests run there, you will most likely not fire that suit anyway, because, well, 30 seconds is a lot of time. I can have like three Facebooks open. And with integration tests, it's also pretty bad, because if you, the, the, the research, uh, the, there was a gentleman from Saber, I think, in 2010, showing us the research that they did there, that if you have tests, integration tests running uh, for more than three minutes on, a, on, on the machine of the developer, the developers tend not to fire those tests anymore, and just throw it to the Jenkins and say, yeah, yeah, the integration, continuous integration will actually fire this and tell us what happens. And if you have integration tests that take four, four, 45 minutes, then actually I would never fire them on my laptop because what, would, what else would I do during that time, right? 45 minutes. We can have a meeting, which is a waste of time. Okay. So remember that you have the budget for tests, and you have to be careful with this budget, and this budget is very, very small. And for all the tests, together the integration and the unit test, the three minutes is completely maximum, okay? And aim for that. So to summarize uh, the things I've shown you, focus on testing modules instead of classes, which is too low, or doing only integration tests on the whole system, which is too high and too slow, basically. Test the behavior, test the black box, and not the implementation. So don't, don't, uh, don't, let, it, don't let the implementation uh, go out, and, and do not touch the repository out there in your tests. Prepare sample data for the module, for every single module, and reuse it as often as possible. Your experience will be much better with that. Hide API for integration under meaningful names and meaningful from the domain perspective, right? Build a small DSL. Whenever you, you think that you can express it better, think about it. How, how you, could you do it? If you, could, if you had only the whiteboard, what would you draw? And maybe you can build a DSL for each single module because each single module can have a different DSL because it's bounded context usually, right? It can have even a completely different architecture as well. And then think about uh, the explaining this at the whiteboard and extract, every, extract all the slow integration tests that you have with the I.O. and move them to jars, create libraries for that, see what things you do not need to change as often, but you actually pay the price for every single build running this, okay? Because it slows you da down. And if, it, if it's something that you can, move it away. Now, work with this 30 second maximum budget for unit testing, or maybe 10 seconds, I would prefer. And you can have, in 30 seconds, you can easily have 3,000 unit tests, no worries, right? And then work with three minute budget for integration from the start. And remember that tests are the specifications, are the requirements. So you should really pay attention to actually how you write them to express the requirements and to be able to reason about what should happen inside the system. And it will uh, also help you to actually communicate with your client. And expect this job, this job of refining requirements and actually uh, creating the scenarios to be very, very hard, which I talked about yesterday. So if you haven't been on my talk yesterday, you can watch it on YouTube, I suppose. So that's pretty much it. I would like to thank you for, from here. I would like to thank my, my team for uh, embracing uh, all these ideas and actually using them and, uh, and uh, improving them all together. The guys, you, you are awesome, right? And if you need this presentation later on, it's already on the web. And if you need a job, you can contact me as well. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Do we have any questions? There, there is the question.
Hello. Uh, okay. You prefer to use uh, in-memory uh, repository. Yes. What about testing the real repository? Do you think it's needed or not? Uh, with real repository, with a yeah. database? In the implementation of real repository. Uh, yeah, so I do test that because these are the integration tests, right? And I will show you how it works. Uh, now, here I have the in memory file, uh, in memory repository, right? And I have the unit tests so far. Everything is unit tested. But then I write integration tests, and here I talk with the HTTP, and I, st I start implementing this, and I talk with the HTTP and with the real database that I have in memory. So, in my case, this was the MongoDB, for example, or maybe H2 if I, if I use a rep uh, uh, SQL or a relational database, right? And this is pretty much it. I don't need to actually test the repository out there because the flow and the, all the SQLs that go there and all the queries will be fired here, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, so what about getting to the point that your DSL is so complex that you actually would need to test the DSL? Or maybe in a less... Uh, clean approach than that. I have seen tests that have this plumbing method that goes for like 300 lines and you can read the test but do you really believe you know what's happening in that plumbing method? Okay, I'm not, I'm not getting the, the, the clue here. You, you're saying that what, what is the problem with something very large like a long running transaction or with a very... No, no I mean once you develop the DSL it gets yeah. more and more complex. So no. what if bugs start appearing in your DSL instead of, you know... That, that's a very good question. What, what if we created a DSL and it's so hard that how do you test your tests, basically, right? The answer is you don't. And the reason why you don't is because the chance for actually... Let's, let's show, uh, let's show uh, a DSL for that, right? The, actually, the chance, the chance for you to screw it up twice inside the unit test, or basically the DSL, right? And again, in the production code, is very, very low. So you, do, you, you can just not worry about it. And also, the, another reason for that is you still need monitoring, right? Okay, so test-driven development is no way to actually, you know, just throw away your monitoring. You still need monitoring and production. But how often do I have a problem where I've made a mistake on the test? And I also made the same mistake on, in production code. Maybe that happens once in a mo month, one month in two months. I don't remember exactly because I don't remember such cases because they are so rare. So I wouldn't worry about that. Unless, actually, your DSL is growing very, very large. But if your DSL is growing very, very large, the question is, maybe your modules are too big? A uh, question about those in memory uh, implementations yep. of uh, IO related okay. stuff. Yep. So, uh, what if you want to use some more sophisticated uh, features of your backing database so they are not easily, or it's, let's say, it's not feasible to implement them just by uh, trivial hash map? So this is a very interesting thing because actually this is what I expected. I expected it to not be so simple to implement, for example, in-memory version of a, of a database because I have all those queries which are very, very strange, right? It turned out to not be, the, not be true and not be a problem at all. And the reason why it turned out not to be a problem is because if you do not, if you're still in memory, only in memory and CPU. So if you need to find something, if you need to create a, a hard query, for example, or create a graph using, you are using PostgreSQL and you, you need a graph part, or you need a JSON, you're just storing JSONs there, or doing any, anything fancy, for example, or just maybe going with pointers and just streaming the data right in. All those things are very, very simple in plain Java if you do not care about the size. And in tests, you should not have a lot of data. Why you should not have a lot of data? Because every single object that you create will actually cost you something. So you need only the data that you, you should have to actually verify your assumptions. That's pretty much it. So it turned out that whenever we need something fancy, and maybe I don't have an example of a fancy here, then all we need to do is stream, filter, map, and so on, and it's done, right? And if you have 10 elements in the in-memory the in -memory database, that's all you need. So I haven't had, I haven't had an experience of actually requiring uh, kind of a specific behavior that I couldn't model in plain Java. It's always the other way around when in plain Java it's very, very simple, but if you want to have that on a big data set, you need a real database, that's it. Um, 
so one, one comment to that um, from my, my experience what comes handy in such situations are contract tests uh, where you have the same test suite for multiple implementations so you can test your fake implementation and your real implementation with the with the same suite of tests so the, they they share the specs but they uh, for instance in JUnit it's possible to have an abstract test class which uh, specifies uh, test cases and then implementations uh, do all the setup required. So one implementation can yeah. be uh, run with uh, Spring uh, Spring Runner and the other uh, in memory. Yeah. So uh, I haven't shown you uh, this here, but actually I use the same approach because what I have is when I write the the, uh, the, the module and I have everything you need tested, right? I write out those acceptance spec specifications or tests as well there, and then I copy and paste them to the integration test and I just write the integration code just to interact with the system, but it's basically the same test. We found out that it's better for us. At the very beginning, we thought like, okay, if we have the, the acceptance specifications in the integration test, maybe we don't need them in the unit testing part, and we just need to, uh, to test the corner cases. But that's not true, because I want to fire out, uh, the unit test, and the unit test come first. This is the first thing I produce. So we, we turn into the, the, uh, the situation the other way around. So all my tests are actually tested, as you said, the in memory version and the real database, at some point, these two tests, there are two separate tests for me, but they test exactly the same behavior. How do you keep them in sync? How do I keep them in sync? I don't. Uh, and I don't keep them in sync because they, they never break separately. Because if it breaks in the unit testing code, or basically in the pure Java domain, then it will break in the integration test as well. And if something breaks only in the integration test, then you know exactly that this is the integration problem because, for example, your query is wrong or your integration part with the I.O. is wrong, right? And this is what you actually want to have. More questions? More questions? I have a question about mm, testing with in-memory databases. Yep. Uh, we encountered the problems that we, for example, were using uh, Postgres uh, SQL, but uh, for the tests we used H2 yep. in-memory. And uh, what about uh, keeping the schema? Because, for example, you can have uh, more complex things done uh, in the Postgres, while H2 doesn't support that. Uh, do you keep the two versions of the schema, or okay. what do you do? So first of all, I mean, when, when I say that I'm I do not have the situation when my in-memory database is H2. I, I treat that as an I.O., to be honest, right? So when I say talk about an in-memory version of my I.O., then I'm talking about just plain Java class, right? No, no, it, it takes time for the H2 to actually get up, okay? And this is way too slow for me. But testing H2 versus, for example, PostgreSQL, right? Now, I don't have that situation right now, I'm using Mongo, but b before I had that situation, and sometimes, if you're very fancy with your database and using PostgreSQL, PostgreSQL is beautiful and has got so many features, then actually what you should do, stop testing with H2, okay? There are many approaches for actually testing, and one of them is to have your uh, database start up in memory, and it's beautiful because you control the whole thing, so it goes together with the code, so that uh, whenever you are testing this with the code uh, and you want to, for example, see how another branch works, you, you just move to that branch and you have a, a proper schema for that branch. But this is not the only way. The other way is actually to have a single database inside the company, all right, for your project. This is a testing database, which is usually immutable. You do not modify the data day there, and it's very simple because you just do rollbacks after, after each transaction, right, uh, begins. And you test against this. Why would I write an integration test against the H2 if the integration that I really want to verify is the PostgreSQL, right? The only reason why I would use H2 is because I, tried, I, I trust H2 to be exactly the same with simple cases as the Postgre, PostgreSQL, which is the case for me. But if I had something more advanced, I would throw H2 away. Why would I need that? Because I'm going to use advanced features from the PostgreSQL. And if working with the PostgreSQL actually has, is a problem for you uh, in, inside the integration test, because the PostgreSQL is somewhere out there and it's got, it may have a different schema, although Flyway and Liquidbase will help you a lot with that, but you cannot change the schema just for one test, and for example, two people are working with the database, so if one of them changes the schema, it also changes for the other guy, then you may think whether you want the, this single feature of your PostgreSQL that you're using, let's say the object store or whatever else, and treat it as a library. 
and hide it underneath, and in, the, in your integration test, use only the in-memory version that works on the H2, but just streams the data, for example, and, and just filters and maps everything. But have the uh, uh, external jar for the PostgreSQL, where you will have all the integration tests against the PostgreSQL, and you then you can even slow things down and use a Docker, fire up the real PostgreSQL, fit it with data, and just have a very, very slow test. But you will not touch that on every single build, so it doesn't matter that much. Okay, if that could be the last question then, because we have to clear out the... Uh, but if you guys want to talk to Jakub, uh, yeah. you can just come up to him. Thank you.